This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Stabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Peter Holland, McNeil Family Professor of Shakespeare Studies in the Department of Film, Television, and Theater, University of Notre Dame. We will begin by taking a close look at Peter's recent book entitled Shakespeare and Forgetting. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University Institute of the Humanities and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Peter, welcome, welcome, welcome to the program. We're so happy to have you here and happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. And a happy Thanksgiving to you, however you're celebrating it in Japan. For some reason. I remember reason. a while ago um, when I'd been at Notre Dame, just uh, two or three years, and the, the very nice local woman who was the administrative assistant for my department looked at me and said, how do you celebrate Thanksgiving in, in England? And I said, but we don't. And she was completely and utterly flawed by the thought that we didn't. I said, we, we could celebrate the fact that we got rid of the colonies, but but it doesn't kind of work. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't work in Japan either. <laughs> in fact, they ramp up the work week this time of uh, our term, and it's always a, a disappointment. I, I am nostalgic, you know, from my childhood in America. And uh, so uh, just wonderful to have you. Uh, what, I wanted to start out with your book and get on to that pretty quickly. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, this is a recent book, I believe. Uh, uh, the timing of this program, I believe, we can expect a paperback edition of this. That's right. Also, uh, paperback due out, I'm told, in February, which is really good news, because academic books, being the price they are, uh, paperback may make all the difference. Absolutely, some people can get to read it. Absolutely, and this is Shakespeare and forgetting, and yes. we're going to talk about that now. This book has challenged me, Peter. I have read uh, several parts mm. of it twice uh, because it does get uh, it, it does get complicated. There's a and there's an enormous amount of uh, critical theory and uh, philosophical as well as scientific um, studies in the human physiology. Uh, th this area covers everything from day to day life to our most uh, spiritual or reflective thoughts. Well, I'm glad you you felt that way. I I. I found it just an endlessly fascinating topic. When when I first came to Notre Dame, uh, and that's now just over 20 years ago, this is my 21st year at Notre Dame, um, I thought that it would be a good idea to establish a, a conference, to hold a conference, because the endowed chair I hold is a brand new one. I'm the first holder of it. And I wanted to celebrate the wonderful family that, that made it possible. Um, and... I was looking around for the topic and, and memory studies were just beginning to be really important in Shakespeare work. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to look at the intersection between Shakespeare and memory and performance. But I found that my own contribution to that conference, and we turned it into a book with Cambridge University Press not long afterwards, I got very interested in the idea of forgetting. Mm -hmm. That somehow the vast expansion up to that point and very much since that point in memory studies has lost sight of the, the fact that most of the time, much of what we do, we forget about. Indeed, we forget almost everything. And I'm not just talking about, you know, as we get older, names go and um, who was that person and where, where did I put that book and where are my glasses? Um, I'm talking about something else, which is about the, the way in which every time we go to the theatre, for instance, and we come out, we have forgotten on the way out 98% of what just happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That we really don't retain that much of the performances we go to. Even people like me who are, pride ourselves on being professional, thoughtful, scholarly theatre goers, unless I'm actually taking notes, my, my brain doesn't retain it. The overload of sensory information in the theatre gets in the way. And I'm fascinated by the way in which Shakespeare characters forget things, by the ways in which we forget about characters in Shakespeare. You know, how is it that at the end of Lear, we're not sitting on the edge of our seat saying, 
I wonder where Lear and Cordelia are. Instead of which, that all those things go on, and then suddenly Edmund reminds us, my writ is on the life, and oh my gosh, and I hadn't thought about it for all this time. I mean, my bad, Shakespeare yeah. wants me to be that bad. He wants my forgetfulness. Uh, and that seems to me a fascinating area. And, yeah. and partly because it, it is fundamentally and this is crucial to my thinking about it, an involuntary activity. Uh, an involuntary activity. And uh, you're focusing here, and I think our viewers should uh, know this, you're focusing on forgetting as yes. something, of, as a distinct thing that's uh, not the opposite of memory, but uh, as you show in your introduction and, and other people have talked about, in, in, uh, intermixed, inextricably entwined with memory and also Absolutely. not forgetting as a, as a pejorative all the time. Uh, yep. that, that sometimes uh, it is necessary and sometimes we willfully forget and those those types of forgetting. We, we, we would like to forget. Sometimes we find we're unable to forget the things that we most want to remember. And sometimes we rather helplessly cannot forget something that is trauma. It may be blocked, but it may resurface. So when Hamlet is saying in response to the ghost, that he will, from his memory, wipe all trivial fond records. He's talking about an impossibility. Mm. Mm. He's, he's talking about deliberately setting out to erase his own memory. Mm. Now, I can erase things on my computer. I can choose to delete things. And I know that if it came to it, the FBI could probably find it somewhere in the cloud. But, but for all normal purposes, I can delete things. And indeed, from time to time, we've all deleted things by mistake mm -hmm. but in terms of our own brains as opposed to the memory systems we use we don't make that as a deliberate choice mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i became fascinated years ago long before really i got into this topic because of a wonderful book by luria the great russian neuropsychologist and it's called the mind of a nemonist it's mm -hmm. one of those words we can't quite say nemonist uh, and it was about a subject he worked with for years who had the most phenomenal memory. And this guy had been a journalist and his boss got cross with him because he'd given him all kinds of instructions and the guy hadn't taken any notes. And his boss said, how dare you not take notes about what... And he simply repeated back to his boss, word for word, exactly what his boss had said because he had this simply phenomenal memory. And... After a while, as Luria worked with him and discovered the extent of that memory, the man was working as a kind of vaudeville artist, a memory man, a bit like the man in, in the 39 Steps. That's the one I always think oh, about, yes, Mr. Yes. Memory, um, who knows about the organization called the 39 Steps. Yes. But he was given kind of number strings and would remember them and so on. And he realized that he was overloading his memory with useless number strings and then he had to solve a puzzle mm -hmm. how can i forget them because his memory wouldn't let him forget whereas my memory and yours won't let us remember, remember. most of what we want to remember and so i'm just fascinated by that as a as an alternative world a world where you can't forget but wish to forget like that beautiful character that Boch has created in the story we used to know as Funes the Memorious, Funes the Memory Man, um, who is unable to function because of the excess of his memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm just intrigued by that as one aspect of it. And then that contrary thing that has become so powerful for us in, in literary circumstances, film and in TV and all other circumstances, as well as in our own lives, the horror of Alzheimer's and the realization that someone may be going to that point where they will remember nothing. Mm -hmm. They cannot possibly retain memory yeah. of, of yeah. even things that are trivial day-to-day -day activities. Um, yeah. And we all know somebody who's gone through it and we know even more the stress and strain on their partners yeah. for going through it. So 
my my book is really concerned with with many many things and it ranges far and wide and sometimes it kind of doesn't want to remember where it's going oh um, no i i i thought when i was uh, yesterday i was reviewing a couple of things and I was, i'm thinking you know that's it's a wonderful thing that uh, uh peter holland ended up in the midwest because <laughs> this free, this freedom is sort of like you're on the plains there, you know, is uh, oh, yeah. and you feel perfectly free to wander through Shakespeare and wander out and then wander back through Shakespeare. And I love the way that works. I love the interconnectedness with the Shakespeare and the and the kind of world that you're building here. Uh, a thought a thought project that uh, just, you know, for, for those of us in the business, uh, it triggers us to think about other examples you know there's so many they're endless uh they're endless and i don't aim to be in any way covering all the field or the book will be very long indeed it's quite long enough but i remember i'd been on leave and i came back and and i was then an associate dean and, and my dean said to me you know how's the book going and i said well, i've got a long way during my leave i'm really pleased with the progress and he said and, and, and what's the the thesis of the book and i looked at him and i said um i know you won't believe this john but there isn't one. <laughs> but, and, and he really was completely shocked by the idea that there wasn't a thesis. And, and I think my problem is, and, and I don't know whether you have the same problem, but many, many academic monographs I read the, these days, I don't read. I mean, that is, mm -hmm. I read the introduction and perhaps the first chapter, and then I read the particular case study that interests me because I know what's going to happen. Yeah. And in my book, well, no, the chapter that might be the kind of theory chapter at the beginning is about halfway through That's because right. I wanted to get towards it, not to plant it at the beginning, like conquering the mountain and planting the flag and ask people to do a bit of work thinking about these things with me, yeah. not my thinking for them. That's right. You promise your reader that you will get to the uh, framework. If it's not a thesis, that's a framework Certainly that you're working with later on toward maybe toward the end even. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, let's let's uh, let us let us go then you and I through this whole <laughs> I, I, lo I love that experience. You know, one of the greatest lectures I ever heard at a conference was by Peter Lake, the historian, brilliant, brilliant historian. And he was giving a paper and I was sitting listening to it. And I thought, you know, it's a surprise he hasn't talked about this. And about a minute later, he said, well, most of you are probably sitting there thinking, I wonder why he hasn't talked about this. Mm -hmm. And then he did the same thing a bit later on. I was puzzling. Surely he's going to touch on this problem. Uh -huh. And then he said, you're probably sitting there thinking, surely I'm going to touch on this problem. <laughs> and I love the way in which he made me work to stay with him. Mm -hmm. And he knew what I was thinking, as it were. He knew what the audience was looking as a possible loophole in his argument, a failure to consider. And then he offered that piece. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so delightful, so brilliant, so much that not I'm going to take your hand and lead you through something I've already mapped, but I'm going to make you work to map it with me. Mm -hmm. That the, the best charts are ones we create together, not the ones I lay out for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's how I've always preferred working. It's how I hope my readers enjoy the journey. Yeah. The journey that they are working at, not just being carried along by. Yeah. Well, this is such a readable book. Uh, and uh, yes, I confess to having read uh, almost whole academic books from the index to the page that I wanted to the specific quotation or area, you know, section that I wanted and realizing after a year or two that I've read most of the book that way uh, in bits and pieces. And this is a uh, straight through. And also one thing that struck me, we, we know you as a, as an editor and as an editor's editor, uh, an enormous amount of work that you've been uh, involved with along with your scholarship and criticism and that sort of thing. But the editorial eye and this type of book don't seem to be in conjunction with one another. Yet, as I think about it more, I think it it very much is because of this these moments of serendipity, maybe, that you run across as an editor when you see these details uh, that 
uh, you you can come back around and say, okay, you know how we put things on the shelf and say, I'm going to look into this a little bit more later. But isn't this interesting? You know, as I'm going this Absolutely. way, I see these other things. And that's a sort of tour that you're, you're taking us on uh, through the Shakespearean part of this book. I, I mean, I, I love editing. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. Um, and particularly, I love editing Shakespeare and writing commentary notes. Indeed, I find writing commentary notes much more fun than writing the introduction. Uh, <laughs> whereas I know many other people, it's it's entirely the other way around. And I love those details, those moments of realizing that's what he's getting at at that moment. And, oh, this is the reference that comes up, or this is the shade, the multiple shades of meaning he's playing with at this moment. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I teach a course, as I do regularly here at Notre Dame on, on editing uh, with my graduate students, uh, uh, graduate students from any part of the English department, not just the ones who may be early modernists, um, and, I, and I tell them that, you know, uh, a good editor lies awake in the middle of the night worrying about whether that comma should or should not be there in a line of the text. And mm -hmm. I get that baleful look of disbelief. And then as the semester continues usually most of them say to me at some point you know what i was worrying about a comma in my sample that i was working on for you uh, in exactly the way you describe isn't it uh -huh. fun isn't yeah. it fun and that's the yeah. point it wasn't that it's a worry that that stresses you but it's a fun puzzle to be working with yeah yeah it surely is and i uh, i have become more and more involved you know, as we teach these texts over and over, and I'm in a second language situation, so it is, uh, I have to explain, we all do, even in first language situations, you know, you have to explain what lines mean, and the, the big problem with that is that you have to know what they mean yourself, or at least you have to come to it prepared to talk about what it might mean. Or you sometimes have to say, I really don't know what this <laughs> line means. Or else, yeah, <laughs> It, it's a puzzle oh, no. and I can't resolve it. And yeah. the accumulation of that commentary uh, is, is a wondrous thing. Um, mm. One of the mighty works that I've been using as I uh, am I'm working on my current project, I'm editing King Lear for the Arden Shakespeare Fourth series, uh -huh. um, is uh, uh, the, the most recent major scholarly edition. It's the one that Richard Knowles created mm -hmm. for the new variorum series yeah and it it is a mighty work in every conceivable ways and and a weighty work it's two hefty volumes in tiny type each of a th over a thousand pages so mm -hmm. this edition is well over two thousand pages long of, of tiny type and I, I sit there straining my eyes, reading uh, sometimes with a magnifying glass when I get overtired, uh, reading this accumulation of commentary and the thoughtful, careful, modest, evaluative way in which Richard Knowles weighs up what so many centuries of commentary have, have been for particular lines and reaches sometimes a conclusion and sometimes not, sometimes just offering different examples, sometimes pointing out silly flaws in some scholar's reasoning that has led them somewhere, be it an 18th century scholar or a 20th century scholar. And yet all of that commentary is fascinating and well worth reading. Mm -hmm. All of those suggestions by others that we need to evaluate and make sense of before we reach our own temporary solutions and they're only ever temporary yeah yeah well this this uh this segues with the idea of forgetting and the idea that so much is forgotten and you and i can uh, go back to our youth and remember uh movies and bands and trend all kinds of things that have been completely forgotten uh yeah. it just surprised me when i brought up the name uh, a couple of years ago bob dylan in one of my classes and most of these kids had no idea who i was talking yeah. about that's bob dylan right and then you take it into textual editing and you know uh better than <laughs> most everyone in the world uh you know that a text that comes out in a quarto edition uh, uh, some certain things appear, and then it comes out in the folio edition uh, 20 years later, let's say. And 
things have changed. And uh, I just had a, several thoughts on this, but we may get to them. But in that 20 year period, the some of those changes have to do with the fact that that quarter bit has been culturally forgotten, not necessarily necessarily forgotten by the people who edited the uh, folio edition, but they just are not pertinent anymore. The joke is not funny as funny as it was in 1601 or that kind of thing. That, I mean, that is certainly true. And um, we all know that experience of, of students saying to us, uh, where are the jokes? I don't, I, I don't understand what's funny at this point, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I have that all the time when I listen to one of my favorite, favorite forms of, of pleasure, Gilbert and Sullivan. And there are clearly jokes in, in Gilbert's libretti that are now completely and utterly lost. And I go to, you know, annotated editions, the annotated Gilbert and Sullivan and so on, the annotated Savoy operas, and nobody can quite elucidate what on earth he's on about at that moment. Um, and in the end, I find that doesn't matter because I can still relish the extraordinary rhyming, the, the, the great delight in language, which Gilbert exudes at every moment in his texts. And that's in itself the pleasure, even if I don't get the gag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I enjoyed uh, some years back uh, the movie Topsy Turvy. Oh, Ex explained absolutely. quite a lot, didn't it? In, in a way, it was a kind of annotation of of both Gilbert and Sullivan, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, beautifully well done, and wonderfully uh, wonderful way to bring Gilbert and Sullivan back into the public consciousness. And, uh, and it was it was all about that endless feud between them. I mean, we yeah. think of them as an, a natural double act. And in fact, no. it was an extremely fraught relationship. And there yeah. must have been moments like that for Shakespeare with the company. Come on. Oh, yes. There must have been that moment, you know, um, um, the late, much lamented Anthony Scher, uh ha has this line that, you know, uh, it's a little known fact that after he... Um, Richard III had gone through its first performances, Burbage said to Shakespeare, if you ever do that to me again, I'll kill you. Um, that putting somebody through the ordeal of the hunchback, the limp, the withered arm, um, that's really, really tough. And I remember years ago at the, at the RSC, David Troughton playing the role, and he had an agreement with the company that he could have as many remedial massages as he needed he said no role is worth damaging your health for <laughs> or indeed when Sher played it he had two humps a left one and a right one so he wasn't always twisting his body in the same way mm. but that was designed just to ease the intense physical pain of playing a role like that yeah yeah um I'm trying to remember the movie. I think it was a Neil Simon uh, play, Goodbye Girl. And uh, there's a joke in there about the director convinced that Richard was was gay. And also, uh, and, and so the actor had to go through the whole thing. There was, a, there was a joke in all of that. It might not play as well now. It might seem to be a little bit insensitive, but I don't think so. I think that that's... Uh, the the point being that directors get these things in their heads uh, and and try to add on to Shakespeare, who is already adding on plenty, you know, particularly Absolutely. with Richard. And uh, but you you know you have to make it new uh, because of, guess, puzzles, because of what's remembered. You know, you, you don't want to give people something they've already seen. Is yes. I'm getting now confused. Uh, but the uh, you know the I think this is a point that you make the idea of going through. Um, going to a play and being uh, satisfied with it not being that different, you know, knowing that you've and been that, ed edified. That's an old thing um, uh, that we've somehow lost. And yeah. I mean, I think um, the, the area in which it's, it's often still present is in opera. Yeah. And um, a company like the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden will keep a particular production in its repertory for decades, literally yeah. decades. Yeah. Uh, the cast may change, but the set and the production is still pretty close to what they originally did. And I think of what it was like in the middle of the 18th century, when for over 40 years, 
Macklin played Shylock. And yes. I don't think Macklin's performance changed across that time greatly. It wasn't that he had a sudden, oh, I can't do it that way. I've done it like that for the last 38 years. I better change it now. No, people came to see it the same again. And I remember as a child going to see Gilbert and Sullivan, since we were talking about Gilbert and Sullivan. And of course, the only way you could see professional Gilbert, Gilbert and Sullivan in my childhood was the productions of the Doily Cart Company that toured around. And they stayed absolutely the same. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see the same show. Mm -hmm. We wanted the same bits of stage business. Mm -hmm. We wanted the same extra gags uh, at absolutely. the same time. Every time you went to see the Mikado, you wanted to see that bit again. All right. If they don't pull out those fans with the three little maids from school, if they exactly. don't have that going, exactly. then it's just not Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, exactly. because that's that's what we that's what we remember. And that's the way we've been trained to enjoy this. Uh, so well, I, I yeah. keep hoping that, you know, sometimes, of course, I'm, I'm excited by new productions of Shakespeare. I, I, of course I am. I'm thrilled by discoveries and ways of thinking that that an, a director, an actor, a designer, the whole company can create in a particular place at a particular time that makes me think about a play in a totally different way. Mm. But I also love those productions that I can go back to. Mm -hmm. And that now, particularly in our current era of widespread recording of theater productions, that absolutely exhilarating new phenomenon yes yes i i, I noticed I, I got the other day the standard email from the national theater telling me about what was coming up in the next few months and so on mm. and one of the things that's coming up is a play uh, about the production of hamlet in 1964 on broadway directed by sir john gilgood and starring richard burton mm-hmm and it's a play about what was a complex and in some ways troubled relationship and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can watch that production because it was filmed in what was then thought of as a brand new thing called, wait for it, theatrovision. And it was filmed okay. on three days and they edited it from that footage. And then it was released for movie theater screenings all across America with detailed instructions, Judith Buchanan has done wonderful research on this, to the cinema managers about how to make sure their patrons would enjoy this experience, plenty of fresh flowers in the foyer, make sure the restrooms have been properly cleaned, all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then all copies were sent back and destroyed, <laughs> except one copy was given to Burton. And that copy is the only one that survived. Ah. So when you put your DVD in to watch that production, as you can do, thank goodness Richard Burton didn't throw it away along with everything else, yeah. right? Yeah. That's how we've still got a detailed visual record of that production. Yeah. How thrilling. Yes. Uh, well, so much, uh, this goes right back to forgetting, uh, so much is lost in the theater. Uh, we talk about what people remember, what they respect, uh, what they um, what they expect. And uh, you you spoke earlier about how much we lose before we even get out of the door. Uh, uh, but uh, this idea of being able to film so easily everything that's put on and really a kind of need to do that. I mean, you you sort of owe it to the cast and owe it to the director and all the people who work so hard. You know, it, it's that thing about the performances when it finishes its run. It's just it just goes into air, you know, and we talk about something we saw in 1982 or 1993. Uh, however. I, I, I was just thinking as as you were talking about the fact that I saw, and I won't say when and where, just this miserable production of The Tempest. The actors were good. The director was good. It just didn't fall together. It, yep, it, it just wasn't good. And I'm thinking, I bet the members of that cast are very happy that that was not recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and, and you know, the, the art of the ephemeral is sometimes deeply to be desired. Yeah. But my students find it difficult to believe that things are not always everywhere available. Mm -hmm. And of course, I talk in class 
about productions that I saw before they were born, before their parents were born, sometimes before almost now, I suppose, their grandparents were born. Um, and, and they look at me in, in, in a rather kindly mode of shock about this, you know, why do I want to go back to a production I saw now, sometimes 60 years ago? Uh, that something I was taken to as a child um, that that has stayed with me. A moment in it has stayed with me, and I I cherish those. And I, there are things about those moments that deserve to be remembered. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I'm teaching this semester a, a course called simply King Lear, and the. Students have been reading the play with me slowly, week by week, um, uh, for the first half of the semester. And now we've been exploring different kinds of productions and different kinds of films. And I have been able to show them and for them to think about Peter Brook's wonderful film version with Paul Schofield. Yeah. It, yeah. Astonishing piece of film. Uh, it really is. It really is. Every time I watch it, it blows me away all over again. But I also have some memories because my parents took me to see King Lear when I was pretty young uh, uh, at the Old Witch in London. And there are things I remember from that experience that didn't make it into the film. Yeah. Couldn't have made this into yeah. the film because they were theatre things. Yeah. Yeah. There was a famous moment at the end of the first half. And the first half of that show was two hours long. I remember it said in the program, there is an intermission after two hours. And I was thinking, yeah. oh, my gosh, you mean I've got to sit here for two hours? Yeah. And the moment was after the blinding of Gloucester. Oh my and Brooke, yeah. Brooke had cut, uh, as the folio cuts, the servants in, in Quarto who look after Gloucester, go off to fetch some flax and wine to let white of eggs to anoint his eyes and so on, and to take him to the bedlam beggar to, to, to lead him and so on. All of that, Folio doesn't give, and Brook cut. And instead of that, what happened at the end of that long, long first half was a blind Gloucester trying to find his way off the stage as servants rushed to and fro and knocked into him, and they were far too busy to be bothered with this figure and yeah. the house lights came up while he was still trying to find his way off stage oh yeah and we were part of that world in which nobody was helping gloucester yeah stunning, yeah. stunning. absolutely stunning to, to do that it reminds me of the break give me some light or give me light uh and uh, and the lights, that's a, uh, maybe uh, all the way through has been a cue to to bring in some light, uh, yes. even, even before there was electricity. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can only get that in the theater. That's a theater. Uh, and I don't mean, therefore, you can't film it. You can film it. Yeah. But you have to remember well, what you're watching is something that plays differently in the theater at that moment from the way you watch it now on a recording, even if there is a recording available. And how the camera movement controls what you can and cannot see is a very powerful effect. Yeah. I, I, just a, a few weeks ago, um, I was running a, a workshop uh, for the Folger Institute uh, on this whole question of live theater broadcast, uh, the, the, the live theater experience and, and what that's all about, working with two very brilliant colleagues, uh, Pascal Ebersher from the University of Exeter and Erin Sullivan from the Shakespeare Institute of the University of Birmingham. And one of the things we, we, we explored was the way in which the camera moves in particular ways and what that does and how it controls our seeing. Mm -hmm. And I went back a little way after that to watch again the very end of the very first Royal Shakespeare Company live from broadcast, mm -hmm. um, which was Richard II. And th there was a trick at the end of that production, a wonderful theatre trick. The coffin is brought on, Bolingbroke is looking at it, he gives the last lines, and then a spotlight picked out on the gallery behind him, the ghost of Richard II, as it were, mm -hmm. David Tennant standing there, looking down, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. at Bolingbroke. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are in the theater, I remember seeing Tennant taking up his position yeah. before the light caught him. On the recording, the camera is going through a very elaborate movement. Bolingbroke just stiffens slightly. He's aware of something that makes him uncomfortable, but we don't know what it is. Yeah. And yeah. then the camera shows us Richard up in that gallery. So it yeah. tells us when he appears. Yes. It makes us see that moment of appearance. Yeah. I spoiled it. I happened to see Tennant move. I happened to see him arrive on, on the gallery. For myself, it yeah. wasn't the same thing. It wasn't the same thing. It couldn't be the same thing. Um, yeah, I do uh, have to explain uh, every semester to uh, students that uh, let's say we're doing Midsummer Night's Dream, that the reason that they're going on so long about all of the natural things is that you have to put those images of nature in the minds of your audience. You don't get the, uh, you know, we watch uh, bits of film versions and so forth. You know, the camera can pick up all of that, can pan over the flowers and do all kinds of, of things. We'll have a pit or orchestra, basically, you know, background music all the way yep. through. Wonderful stuff. Um, and uh, and yet, uh, and you, you can't get it, though, I don't think, unless you see the effort uh, in that and, and many, uh, in all of all the plays, but particularly in Midsummer Night's Dream, the, the effort to, to get summer, uh, Midsummer, into the minds of the audience. I'm, I'm just convinced that it was a winter production, that it was, uh, because, you know, it's sort of like the pamphlets you get from the tour agency, you know, let's, let's go to Fiji, you know, it's, when it's February, right? Right. Uh, that it just had to be that sort of thing that that was part of the um, uh, uh, of the enjoyment of watching that play, that it was freezing cold outside and that you maybe could make it summer in your mind, right? But at the same time, there's that long description by Titania of the horrors of climate change. About oh, yeah. The failure <laughs> yes. of summer yes. to be summer, about yes. the things that are, are, are amiss. Uh, and, and, that extraordinary ending of that speech we are yeah. their parents and original we are yeah it, it's it's yeah. our fault yeah that this is, is happening yeah that because there is dissension between titania and oberon yeah. the seasons yes. have gone awry yes. well at yes. a time of climate change boy that speech has a very different sense Th doesn't as, it though as, you know as as things yes. happen that i experience directly you know, when the when the temperature in England last summer hit 103 um, and, and it was record breaking and no one has air con in their homes, you know, or when suddenly the, I look at on television at appalling flooding in Pakistan or wherever it may be, the unprecedented effects of climate change, that speech echoes back for me. Um, but yeah. it's, of course... We who are their parents and original, not not the king and queen of fairies, we are responsible. We. Yes, uh, it puts it on the audience, doesn't it? Uh, totally. that speech. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm going uh, on treacherous ground here, uh, speaking about Midsummer Night's Dream with uh, a famous editor of the play, yeah. and so. Uh, uh, but I I am interested in this, and again, going back to memory, I know that your edition. Uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, there's a there's an Arden edition. You did the uh, uh, well. I do the Oxford uh, edition. Uh, Oxford edition, and uh, for very good reasons, uh, you have uh, Aegeus step in as in the folio version uh, instead of uh, uh, Philostrate, uh, and uh, and there's there's a strong argument for that. And uh, I was working on a little paper that uh, is, I don't think it's ever going to come out, it's, uh, the uh, the press, uh, you know, the pandemic and so forth. But I was looking at uh, Philostrate in particular in the uh, folio, or, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the Quarto, the earlier edition. And I, I think that's a, uh, what, what do you say, taking the piss a little bit, taking the piss out of uh, uh, Tilney because Tilney was the master of the rebels and so forth. Yep. And I'm thinking by the time the uh, folio edition came out, that that was no longer uh, a pertinent or funny joke. Because the gag probably didn't... doesn't work in the same way. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I, I have vivid memories of a talk. Um, there, there was a wonderful guy called Bert Parnaby. Um, Bert had been a school teacher and then became one of Her Majesty's inspectors of schools 
he was one of the people who went around to schools and told them what they were doing wrong. And eventually, late in life, he decided that he would do what he had always wanted to do, which was to be an actor. And I listened to him give a talk about playing Philostrate. And he gave a talk that lasted a standard 50 minutes talk mm -hmm. about his experience of playing Philostrate in the, what was then the current Royal Shakespeare Company production. Except in that production, Aegeus got all the lines in, in Act 5, which means his yeah. Philostrate didn't have a single word to say. <laughs> That's right. Because Philostrate right. doesn't speak when he appears in Act One. And yeah. there was Bert giving this wonderful account of what, what was going through <laughs> Philostrate's mind and all the rest of it through this whole experience of a wordless performance. A it wordless. was just delightful. It was a wonderful <laughs> lesson about what fun an actor can have developing a character who in this production doesn't get a goddamn word. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are there are other examples too. Uh, Leonardo and uh, Much Ado has a wife, and, and, yes. and uh, with with no lines, uh, yeah. um, uh, and who appears not once but twice. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are two <laughs> stage directions for her entry, um, and and never gets a line. I've seen productions that have put her on stage um, and tried to do something with her. Um, I think. Shakespeare began with the idea he might create something of this character. He gives her a name, Inogen. Well, that's significant. It's a name he's going to remember and use again yes. uh, the time he gets to Cymbeline. Um, yes. But I think it's one of those classic ghosts where he uh, had an idea and then uh, didn't follow through on it and forgot to cut the stage directions. And nobody bothered to correct the the prompt book or whatever else the book holders copy still had it in but nobody was ever cast in the role in in, in the king's men it never actually happened um mm. but but somehow it stayed there into the text um it's there in print but that's the kind of thing i think that often happens i think shakespeare forgot to cut it that's oh yeah that's another kind of forgetting yeah, and uh, it's just like the the game I always play with my students when we're working on Hamlet, and and I ask them uh, if you go and watch Hamlet, uh, what's the name of Hamlet's stepfather, his uncle, and they all say Claudius, and I say how do you know? Well, it, it's his name, you know, it's in the speech prefixes and so on. Yes, but the name Claudius is never spoken in the play. Right. Yeah. It exists as one entry direction and in one text, a, a speech heading. Yeah. He has no name. The name doesn't exist. I mean, I think this is one of the games that Shakespeare plays, um, or he, he, he found the name, knew the name, thought about using the name, forgot to give anybody a chance to speak the name, and so the name isn't known. In an era before programmes, playbills, whatever we're going to call them, you don't know what a character's name is unless they say it. And sometimes he does that so deliberately, like the fact that, you know, in Twelfth Night, Viola is only named in Act Five. Yeah, yeah. All through the rest of the play, she's only had one name, Cesario, the, the assumed yeah. name. Her yeah. real name is never in play until it's conjured up in that conversation with her brother. Yeah. Yeah, you had me uh, looking through the um, uh, a couple of editions that I have of Hamlet because I never saw that. I, right. I was absolutely certain that somebody says Claudius somewhere in there, and um, no, no, nope. yeah. I, I mean, I you know, and, I'm afraid I can be a very wicked uh, teacher and <laughs> occasionally play tricks on my audience, but uh, on my on my students. But you know, it's it's like why do we talk about a balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet? because yeah. the word balcony is never spoken. No. And what we hear about, what Romeo tells us to look at, is the light that is breaking through yonder window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not, not a balcony. The balcony yeah. is a late 17th century invention. Yeah. Or why do we talk about Lear out in the storm on a heath when the word heath is never spoken? Well, it's because in the Restoration, when Naam Tate's edition was 
created, the one with the happy ending. Tate noted down what scenery was to be used. And at one point he talks about the Heath scene. Yeah. Yeah, this this plays straight into one of the theorists that you mentioned earlier in the book, uh, that uh, how uh, memory is the this act of reconstructing, uh, forgetting certain things. Uh, the, let, the I don't want to talk about origins, but earlier forms and remembering them differently because of things that happen later and you can see yeah. this in your editorial work when you go through all the way through to theobald and pope and all the way through up to modern editions you can see how things are just added on that just become remembered as yeah. shakespeare that are not shakespeare at all yes i mean we all assume there must be a balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. What did they do in Verona? They built a balcony That's in the right. 1930s in, right. in, in the Casa of Giulietta so that there would be a balcony. Uh, but but if, if nobody says balcony, it ain't a balcony. If nobody says heath, it isn't a heath. It's, it's a way in which the language of a bare stage, the language of Shakespeare's theater, which doesn't define location in the same way, can only create location when it speaks of location yeah um that's right yes. so speech becomes all in a certain sense very powerful it very does. powerful as 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 an act of naming once you name it you bring it into being and in the beginning was the word that is a uh, good line that uh, yeah yeah it uh, it makes you it, it makes you pause Yep. You know, when when does something begin to really exist, right, or uh, not exist at all? Uh, well, uh, this is this is just fabulous. I have a thousand things that I uh, would love to uh, consider here, um, and I uh, and I'm <laughs> kind of forgetting them as I. Uh, as I try to uh, think of, of where to go uh, uh, from here, but um, I, I would like to, and I'm not sure how this, you, I think this fits. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about monuments and whether to keep monuments mm. uh, that are monuments to people who have done bad things. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it, just like every other thing in, in media gets polarized and so forth, it isn't nearly enough uh, understanding of of um, what, uh, you know, that there might be some that you keep, even if they're not uh, squeaky clean. Mm -hmm. Others, obviously, this is no good, no good for any anybody. But uh, I'm, I've been in touch with some people uh, recently in Barcelona who are, uh, examining how to remember and the, the memory institute and the european uh, memory institute where uh there's been a kind of consensus that you know when you get into these cities you get into these things that are just so much part of our city and you start stripping them down uh there's, there's a <laughs> hold on a second let's pause maybe they could be used as instructional right and, uh... I, I would like to think they could be. I also recognize that, that it is difficult, as it were, to make people read the instructional material. Yeah. And, yeah. and what we are left with is something that speaks of itself in a way that, that we can't uh, control. Um, we, we face this at Notre Dame um, uh, in, in, in the main building, as it's always referred to, the, the uh -huh. Golden Dome building at, at Notre Dame, there, are, there is a set of murals about Columbus's discovery of America yeah. and its representation of the indigenous, pe indigenous peoples that he encounters is horrible, yeah. simply yeah. horrible. Yeah. And eventually the complaints grew, rightly, coming from many of us about how this this can't be just left in the way it is. Um, and the university took what I think still is the right strong decision. Uh, it's covered the murals. So when you go into the main hall of the dome, the murals are there behind coverings. And on certain days of the year, the coverings are removed so that they can then be used for pedagogic purposes and so on. 
Uh -huh. We can do something that, on the one hand, talks about the skill of the artist, Louis de Gregorio, the artist who, who painted them. And on the other hand, we can use them to teach our students about acts of representation and how this is something that we don't find comfortable and we shouldn't yeah. find comfortable. So um, a purposeful act of forgetting Columbus or forgetting a, 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 how, a, yeah. But not erasing them, not painting not over them, yeah. not doing what John Shakespeare, Shakespeare's father, did when he was bailiff of Stratford upon Avon, painting over the wall paintings in the Guild Chapel. Um, now, one argument is they were whitewashed over so that the whitewash could then be washed off and they could be revealed again if yeah. the prevailing mood, the the Protestant settlement of the Elizabethan era, uh, changed yet again. Um, and yeah. indeed, those wall paintings have now been revealed and we can go into the guild chapel and marvel yeah. at them yeah. and they yeah. are marvelous yeah. they are wonderful uh, i wouldn't want to lose them yes but i also understand why when john shakespeare was effectively mayor of stratford upon avon it was decided they should be painted over this was not the version of of the christian religion that was currently the state policy yeah yeah uh, this is a very difficult subject, um, but I... it's horrendously difficult, and I and yeah. I, I I think anybody who thinks they have a simple right answer uh, is is deeply mistaken. Um, but I don't want to cancel things. I want to remember those things, and I want to remember that. Take an obvious example in in, in the U.S. How many of those monuments to the Confederacy? To the confederate generals and slave owners were put up long after the end of the civil war oh full on jim crow era 1930 yeah. 1930 right through i mean uh, it's, uh, and, and as a direct well a direct affront a, a direct uh, what um uh, affirmation of uh the apartheid era that that, that period Absolutely. was uh and just uh, uh, just a, a complete kind of audacity there, uh, and and uh, and we don't want therefore to say these monuments never existed. I think the yeah. empty plinth is a mark of something. I'm okay. I don't want to take that away. <laughs> I'm okay with a couple of those with those going down the Jim Crow things. You know, oh, yes. take a photograph. And that uh, and that flag, which was uh, never really a, a, a Confederate rallying flag anyway, but that flag put it in a museum. That's what you know people have eventually done. But uh, and yet we still see on cars driving around our streets Confederate yeah. flags on them. Yeah, uh, and we see them at all kinds of political demonstrations and rallies and so on. And I want I want. To use that as a means of saying these are people who have never been willing to accept that slavery was a profound evil. And sometimes the ways in which we make that manifest can be difficult and interesting. I, I, I was in Liverpool a few years ago. It's not a city I know well. I wish I did know it better. Um, but I went uh, for the first and only time to, to the Museum of Slavery that is on the Liverpool docks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not a great museum. It's not It's not an astonishing museum, though it has some wonderful, wonderful things in it. But what it has at one point is one of the most brilliant pieces of museum thinking that I've ever encountered. Yeah. And it yeah. is simply a very big wall, which is covered with standard street signs from Liverpool, street names, just the ordinary way in which a street name exists. And it doesn't say anything about these street names, except at one point it explains, just on the side, every single one of these streets is named after someone who made their money out of the slave trade. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't give you the individual history of all those ind people. Yeah. That would yeah. that would not have the same effect it's after. It's up after the effect that as you walk down your streets in your city, you are seeing acts of naming in memory of people whose background is the wealth from the slave trade. Yeah. And that's that's something that we need to remember. You know, when you walk down the street and it has a name as opposed to a, a kind of vague name, 
you know, I live in South Bend on a street called Park Avenue. That's that's not difficult. Um, but but there are plenty of names even in South Bend, Indiana, that that are, belong to people whose, you know, they are named for people whose whose acts are not ones one wishes to remember, and yet we don't have a mechanism. We don't erase those names. Yeah. We don't do enough to remember those people. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, because these uh, going back a little bit to the Jim Crow thing, uh, and this does tie into Shakespeare in some way because mm -hmm. we were talking yes. about uh, uh, how how you uh, how you build a memory uh, beyond the source, and these um, these statues uh, in every southern town it seemed that I went through in my generation, none of us had any idea who those guys were. That they had been completely forgotten. Whatever purpose that they had served in 1932, there might be a small group of people who would say, "Yes, well, you know, he was one of our guys." You know, I don't know, but uh, they they were <laughs> there was this effort to remember him wrongly, and then it may have been the influence of civil rights, uh, aware that just people just sort of almost like you say somehow covered them. Even though they, they they were not covered, they just didn't exist anymore. You just didn't pay attention. Uh, even with that effort to to build these people into cultural memory, they were forgotten. Uh, which and I guess is I a think good thing. We do the same. I think we do the same with Shakespeare, and Shakespeare yeah. has been an instrument of imperialism and repression over and over and over again, all over the world, and. We need to remember what was done, as it were, in Shakespeare's name by using Shakespeare to do things to people. Yeah. And then we need to find ways of subverting and remaking those meanings in, in different ways thereafter. I'm, I'm going to be teaching a course next, next semester um, that is filling me at the moment. This is that classic moment of why on earth did I ever agree to teach this? Uh, uh, but I'm team teaching with a brilliant younger colleague, Taryn Chun, uh, who, who is an Asianist, who works on Asian spectacle, theatre, film and so on. And we're teaching a course called Simply Shakespeare and Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be looking at all manner of things. But in particular, what excites us is, is the, the richness, the astonishing richness of Asian performance remaking Shakespeare into its own versions, mm -hmm. making something for itself. How Japanese Lear is not Chinese Lear, is not Indian Lear, no. is not, etc., etc., etc. And how the particularities of, of each culture's local and national and, and broader cultural meanings are created through Shakespeare. Yeah sometimes as an act of aggression towards how that Shakespeare has been previously used, and sometimes thinking about it anew, afresh, erasing, remaking, coming to know it differently. Um, and I, I, I'm thrilled at the prospect of the course, and I'm equally delighted that, that indeed um, the modest number of students we uh, uh, decided to, to have as our maximum in the class, um, uh, the class is full. Um, so obviously it chimes with our students' interests in, in exciting ways. Um, I have to say the reason we are team teaching is that neither of us could do it without the other. Uh, Taryn doesn't feel that she's uh, enough of a Shakespearean and I know I'm not enough of an expert in, in Asian forms of, of, of theater and film to do it without her help. But the joining of our mutual knowledge and incompetences um, I hope we'll produce something exciting for the students, and it's certainly going to be exciting for us. Oh, it's good, it's, and it's topical. Uh, the idea Very of much. cultural appropriation hasn't been thought through because people do that all the time, and they do oh. it for a variety of reasons, uh, and and not all bad. Uh, no. uh, because uh, you have, you know, a, a first world society uh, economy in Japan. And when they pull in Shakespeare, uh, except for maybe a, a, mod, a relatively few number of people might think of the iconic Shakespeare, but when you look at uh, Ninagawa or uh, Kurosawa, or and, you know any number that we've been, I've been writing on this, there's just no sense that you you cannot do exactly what you want to do with this, right? Yeah. Uh, 
And it's material that, that, that cries out to be rethought and remade and reworked. Yeah. Um, and, and we do it in different ways in, in much more familiar territory. It doesn't happen so much now, but um, uh, whenever I used to um, show my students as part of a course on Shakespeare and, and film, 10 Things I Hate About You, there would always be a student who would say, I didn't know it was based on Shakespeare. Because why should they know? Nothing in the film says based on the play Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. And if you don't happen to know that it's true and pick up names like the name of the central female role, Cat Stratford, um, uh, you wouldn't, as it were, get it. Um, but now I'm afraid they know. <laughs> They know now. And I yes. think they, uh, my, my yeah. students now, and they love the film, and they should do. Yeah, um, but, I, but I don't want to. I don't want to confess how old I was when I figured out the source for West Side Story. Well, exactly. You know, exactly. I, I was uh, I was a young kid in band, and we played those songs uh, from the right. from the uh, production, and uh, the great, just you know, great score. Uh, and uh, yeah, I I didn't know until later. You know the uh, the the version that that they originally were going to create long mm -hmm. before it reached its final version. No. Originally, it was not going to be about white Americans and Puerto Rican immigrants. Uh, it was going to be about Jews and Catholics. Ah, yes, yes. Is that in your book? No, no I, it's not. I read so. that recently. I'm, I've talked to th uh, three scholars recently and read these books, and that they're getting conflated in my, you know, memory. Uh, but yes, but, I did read this recently. It was supposed, and they, they didn't want it. It was too hot, right? It was too hot. It was never going to work. I, but I would love to know whether now in the archives of all the people who were involved in that early development of the project. There, there is material talking about it, letters yeah, to yeah. and fro. I haven't, I haven't done the research. Perhaps everybody in in musical theatre history knows about all of this already, and I just haven't seen the article that would tell me what I want to know. But I'm fascinated by, as it were, that alternative version that didn't happen, the yeah. version that couldn't have happened, that would never have been the astonishing success it became. Yeah. Ooh, I, I do remember very recently a friend of mine who uh engineer and uh, never studied Shakespeare or anything. And uh, mm -hmm. he said, well, you know, I took my daughter to West Side Story. He said, uh, and he calls me Tommy. He said, Tommy, why didn't you tell me it had such a bad ending? You were, you were out. <laughs> I said, Sam, you don't know that, you know, it's Romeo and Juliet. They die in the end. You know, that's that's Except what happens. They don't. Yeah. No, they don't. Only one of them dies. Only one of them in West Side Story, but yeah, it's, it's a, a sad ending. Thread, yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, uh, he thought he was going to, uh, you know, a nice uh, frivolous musical and take his daughter and so forth, and he goes, you know, eh, this is, and um, it, it's poignant. It's a poignant story, uh, the way they do it, and of course, Shakespeare. But my students are disappointed sometimes, uh, not all of them, of course, but I do have students, and I know they they're thinking, oh, Shakespeare, that's Romeo, that's romance and love, and we're going to read a happy play. They're not, they're, they're not quite aware yeah. of the fact that this is a, a tragedy uh, but, coming into class. So, but, but I don't think we need to protect our children from the confrontation with those kinds of tragedies. I mean, I think there may be an age at which the sexiness of Romeo and Juliet, the obscenity of Mercutio's language and so on, that may be a different kind of problem. Um, but... but <laughs> Yeah. The, the 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 connection the contemplation of death that's not too bad no no that's that's part of i mean my parents didn't say when i was what 11 and uh and they were taking me to that king lear in in in, in london uh it's a bit heavy i don't know whether he's up to this or whether he needs protecting from it yeah. i mean the the first two productions i saw in stratford upon avon um one was uh, a midsummer night's dream a famous production with charles lawton as bottom and the other was othello starring paul robeson uh, his return to the role in in the 5960 season and because robeson was a cultural hero in in, in my family yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and among the jewish left he was always a heroic figure he was so much concerned to identify the connection between the struggles of 
his own racial identity and the struggles of the Jews, yeah. uh, that that we wanted to see Robeson. Yeah. And 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 seeing Robeson was more important than even than in a sense than seeing a fellow. Um yeah. but of course back then only Robeson was playing a role like Othello. Um, other people were playing Othello in blackface. Yeah. In a way that we now find difficult and shocking and painful and yeah. plain wrong. I've I've written about Olivier's Othello, which I saw when when, when it was there and at the old Vic in, in the National Theatre in London and I, I saw it. Um I don't use it in class. I don't know how to use it. I don't know what to do. I think um, I think I can't find a way to cope with it. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to shock my students. I don't want to give them pain beyond some kinds of distress that perhaps are worth experiencing, you know. Um, yeah, well, Anthony Hopkins uh, in the BBC version, yeah. and uh, and I used to, uh, I'm uh, guilty of using that uh, for yeah. years, but I don't anymore. And I I think he he did a fine job with it. Um, in he did his of, best. You yeah. remember why he ended up playing it? I, do you I, do you know? I, I don't know that. No. Oh well, they, they originally wanted to cast James Earl Jones, and bring in a yeah. great American black actor to yeah. play. A fellow, and British Equity refused to allow him in. Oh, you're kidding! Oh my! And Equity, of course, I mean, for good reasons. Um, uh, they said, "Look, if you can't find a black British actor to play it, you're not going to, you know." The, but they ended up going with Hopkins. Um, yeah. And no, I can't. I can't look at that one either. I'm. I'm. You know, there is something there that is far too painful i mean that that the, that is just totally and overwhelmingly wrong i don't i don't view this limitlessly i mean i i do not believe for a moment that that um passionate though i am about my jewish identity that only jews should play shylock mm -hmm. but i also know that sometimes i see non-jews playing shylock and not quite being aware of what they're doing uh-huh and uh -huh. um and sometimes it happens even when it is a Jew playing Shylock. Uh, I mean, there was a an, an example that I I think is is very clear for me in this kind of area of, if you like, I don't want to say it's it's culture wars. It's not that. It's something much more um, profound, profound, I think, than that. But um, yeah. the Rorschach's yeah. Company production years ago, which had Anthony Scher as Shylock, had a moment when in the trial scene there were other Jews in the courtroom with Shylock, yeah. and before yeah. he uh went to take the pound of flesh they began chanting a piece of liturgy oh. and i knew which piece of liturgy it was it's a familiar uh. piece it's 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 a moment in in the passover service when uh we ask god to pour out his wrath upon the heathen uh, and, and those who who have attacked us uh -huh. um and and yet it used in this way at that point it somehow suggested that there was a piece of liturgy that is appropriate for committing a murder ah and i came out fuming distressed my friends i was with didn't understand it because they didn't feel my hurt as it were uh, and i couldn't explain it to them i tried to but but it didn't register for it for yeah. them interestingly one great scholar great editor of merchant of venice amongst much else who did write about that moment was Jay Hallio in his edition of Merchant, because he too found it distressing as a Jew to be confronted by that moment. Yeah, yeah. And and it's a moment when one's identity that is not visible, that is not the same as a visible racial identity, uh, yeah. that does not make me a person of color, um, yeah. still others me in ways it that others you. Well, I, I'm going to uh, let you go in a bit here because I know you have uh, a, a good a feast prepared. But well, I, it, it, yes, I, it is. It is time uh, for the Thanksgiving turkey. But I do want to spend a, a little bit of time because we've okay. been on it. Um, 
that there is this feeling out there somewhere that we're in our ivory towers and somehow uh, uh, some of us may have been born with a silver spoon, as they say. And mm -hmm. Uh, and I wanted to, you're talking about your, your background uh, being uh, of the Jewish faith of a particular generation uh, in the UK, which would be different than, say, in New York or Chicago oh, yeah. or whatever, uh, although better or worse, who knows. But I, I would like you to just talk a little bit about your background, your upbringing, if you, uh, if you, sure. if you would. And, uh, you know, you came from uh, this family. You ended up a, a, a Cambridge graduate and a distinguished professor, but that wasn't necessarily in the cards from your childhood. No, it wasn't necessarily. But, but um, just, just the other week, we had a, a, a week-long celebration on, on campus for first-generation college students. We wanted to, I mean, this was the student body, wanted to encourage them. Um, and they had a, what I call a badge and they call a button made for it. Uh, oh, good. And there it is. Generation. We are the That's golden it. generation. Yeah. Um, and I wore my badge. I asked for one of the badges uh, because I am first generation college and I'm proud of being first generation college. And I don't find that uh, a strange thing to do. My students, of course, assume that because I have... Uh, 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 a, a relatively refined English accent. Um, I must be at least eighth generation college, <laughs> um, uh, if not, you know, back to the founding of the University of Cambridge. Um, far from it. No, I'm I'm first gen college. Um, uh, my father was a, an immigrant from a shtetl in Poland. Um, he came in, in to England in 1927. Uh, when he was 16, along with three friends, they were active, uh, oppo actively engaged in political work, opposed to the Polish government, which yeah. was, of course, yeah. profoundly anti-Semitic. Yes. Um, yes. And they were warned that they would risk arrest. And so they ran for it and they hid away on the first boat in Gdansk that they could stow away on, not knowing where it was going. And as it happens, it went to London. And they came out of the boat and they got absorbed into the Jewish East End, which looked after you. And all you needed to do back then was get a job, show you weren't going to be a drain on the state, then turn yourself into the police, pay a fine, and you were there. And you were, that was it. Um, he didn't take out citizenship till much, much later, but, but that's the beginning, as it were. My mother was born in England. Her parents came from Russia. Um, I, I think they met in London. I don't think they traveled together from Russia, but, but all of that is now lost. Uh, and there is no yeah. way, you know, Ancestry.com can't help us find details yeah. of, of those kinds of families, um, yeah. Jewish families migrating. Yeah. Um, and, and yet none of them of my parents' generation went to college. Yeah. In my generation, six of us went to university amongst my cousins and uh, uh, all of us went to Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, I was the youngest. I didn't go to Cambridge because my cousins had, I went to Cambridge because I wanted to go to Cambridge. It was the course I wanted and so on. Um, but um, uh, we were encouraged to do so because of something in our background that encouraged learning for its own sake. I think my father was so profoundly proud that his son was a, going to college. Oh, yes. Um, uh, and that that was something that he cherished. And he did one thing um, that has caused me a great deal of problems ever since. Um, before I started in Cambridge as a freshman, uh, he opened accounts at the two local bookshops in Cambridge in which the, the, the bills went straight to him. And he said, you know, I don't want you choosing between a book and a beer. Uh, you have your your allowance and you can spend it any way you like and I'm not interfering and and you know but I don't want you to think of books as as somehow not to be bought yeah. the, the reason it's a problem is I can't stop buying books and and and, and not <laughs> my wife and we are we live a life awash with endless heaps of books everywhere that we can't find space for and retirement looms and God knows what we're going to do with all the books then oh the Cambridge but, but, that you attended was not the Cambridge you would attend now if you were from a Jewish background, I mean, I'm imagining look, that uh, you, uh, much more, uh, uh, how, how do you, much more, uh, your, your, what you would typically think would be the student in, in your time 
uh, than now, where you see you would see a far more diverse student body now. But of course, yeah, and uh, but not diverse enough, as Cambridge well knows. Yeah. Um, there aren't enough young people of color going to Oxbridge for yeah. all kinds of obvious reasons to yeah. do with expectation and advantage and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it, it wasn't until I'd left Cambridge and I spent 28 years in Cambridge uh, continuously as an undergraduate, graduate student, postdoc, faculty and so on, uh, that I ever taught uh, a fellow with, a, with somebody who was black in the student group I was teaching. Huh. In my whole time in Cambridge, I did not ever go through that experience. Mm. Um, and of course it's changed and it's changing for the better but it's a slow process of change. Um, it will, I think, get there, and it needs to get there, and it knows it needs to get there. And mm -hmm. the same is happening here at Notre Dame. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the student body at Notre Dame is not as white as it was when I arrived 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The freshman class this year is... 40% international students or diversity students. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those international students are, of course, white students. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, the number has increased significantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Yeah. And yeah. Shakespeare has a role to play in that because Shakespeare can be an instrument of oppression, as we were talking about earlier. Oh, yeah can also be a means of opening up areas of difficult conversation for us yeah. in our classrooms all the time in ways that matter. Yeah. And that it does it in our classrooms, it does it in the theater, it does it in so many different places. Yeah. I was just watching a couple of days ago uh, a, a wonderful, a film of a wonderful solo performance piece uh, by an Australian performance artist uh, Deborah Lice Moore, which is called Cordelia Mein Kind. And it's about her relationship with her father and her father's relationship with King Lear and her father's relationship in particular with a film version of King Lear, a version in Yiddish. So it's, it's about a complex issue of where ownership, if you like, yeah. of a text like King Lear begins to become played out. And part of a relationship with one's parents' generation and grandparents' generation, yeah, and those yeah. those people for whom Shakespeare lived first in Yiddish before they ever encountered it in English. Ah, yeah. Well, so many people encounter Shakespeare here in Japanese before they get to the English. Exactly. Uh, um, yeah. Um, well, uh, Peter, I've kept you way too long. This is a holiday weekend for you, not for me here in Japan. Uh, but one of the advantages of being in the uh, American Midwest is that you do get Thanksgiving. <laughs> you do get Thanksgiving. We do. And, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a great time without the stresses of Christmas. Sometimes Christmas can be a little stressful. Thanksgiving, uh, I've always found to be very relaxing. And so uh, I'm, I would like you to stay just a moment after we finish. But um, uh, I, I wanted to, for our audience and so forth to thank you so much again for joining us today on your Thanksgiving weekend. And thank you, Tom, for giving me the opportunity. It's been a really fun conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.